and uh, welcome to tonight's uh, hangout, uh, My Moon Cosmo Quest X uh, hangout with Will Pomeratz from uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, in case anybody's wondering, I'm, I'm just going to say it. I, I've got my uh, name tag there in Wichita State colors because I, I apologize for everybody's brackets that they're messing up, but I am a Wichita State alumni, so I'm just giving the shout out to my shockers this week. Maybe they'll go on after Saturday, maybe they won't. Remains to be seen. Anyway, um, thank you again for joining us tonight. And let's go ahead and get this thing rolling since we're, we're a little bit delayed. Um, but our guest with us this evening is uh, Will Pomerantz with Virgin Galactic. He's the Vice President for Special Projects at Virgin Galactic, though he's formerly the Senior Director of Space Prizes for the XPRIZE Foundation. And uh, I know of Will primarily through the Lunar XPRIZE. Um, so welcome, Will. And... Uh, the uh, Virgin Galactic and the uh, private space industry is really exciting. I was looking at the website earlier today, and it was uh, a lot of great stuff on it and really exciting stuff. Um, but why don't you, I want you to start off by telling us what, what it means to be a vice president for special projects for Virgin Galactic. Sure. Well, hi, Andy, and, and hi, Pamela. Hi, everyone who's watching. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I love my job title because it can mean whatever I need it to mean. It, it's sort of funny because, you know, I'm VP for special projects. Well, I work at a space line. The whole, the whole thing in and of itself is kind of a special project. Uh, so it gives me a pretty broad license to work on a, a wide range of fun things. Broadly speaking, um, I help the company work on everything that is not space tourism. Uh, obviously, space tourism is, is our core business. It's what people uh, associate the brand with. It, it's something that's really important. It's something that I'm excited about and happy to contribute to. But it's not the only thing that we're doing. We're also involved in another of our other opportunities. For example, using Spaceship Two, our suborbital spacecraft, that same vehicle that our space tourists are going to fly on, is also a great platform to do science, uh, to do education, to do inspirational work. And that's something that really appeals to me. My background is in science. Uh, so when I think about using that that novel platform as a way for uh, for young scientists and really scientists and engineers of all ages to do to do new sets of experiments, I get really excited about that. Another thing I've had the pleasure of working on is uh, something called Launcher One. This is something we just announced this past summer. It's a small satellite launch vehicle that uh, Virgin Galactic is developing. It'll be launched from the same carrier aircraft, the same mothership that we use for Spaceship Two, uh, White Knight Two. You can see her picture behind me there with Spaceship Two slung under the center. Uh, we can sort of take Spaceship Two off the racks and, and put on uh, uh, a two-stage uh, liquid rocket vehicle uh, called Launcher One and carry you know, 500 pounds or so of payload up into space for prices below $10 million, which is another thing that I'm quite excited about. So I get to work on both of those. Um, I get to do kind of a random hodgepodge of other things, uh, whatever, whatever helps the mission. Great. And you know, that just as someone who's really on the outside of, of the uh, private space industry, you hear a lot more about the, you know, the possibilities of being able to send people up uh, into space to individuals and being able to bring that price on for them, but you don't really tend to hear much about the science that could be done with that. And that's, I think, in some ways, is exciting me more because I don't think I'll ever get to go up. Um, so the, the science is really what excites me. Can you say a little bit more about things you, or maybe things you would like to see done in terms of science? Sure. Well, first of all, I hope you do get to go up, uh, and I think we're, we're reaching the point where you will be able to. You know, if it's something that's important to you and, and, and something you want to work towards, uh, it may not be something you buy on a whim, but it is something now that you can uh, save up for and, and make, make that big purchase the way that people have done for years with, uh, with cars or with vacation homes or, or, or things like that. Um, but yes, I, I think definitely people haven't fully come to uh, appreciate the novel opportunities for doing science, for doing educational opportunities. You know, with vehicles like Virgin Galactic and a lot of the other thing, interesting things that are coming up onto the market now, uh, it's just so dramatically reduced the cost of doing anything in space. We haven't necessarily changed the price per pound or the price per kilogram all that much, but we've made it so you no longer have to buy in these massive chunks. One analogy that I use is that with traditional rockets, uh, they work really well. Maybe you could say they're a good value for the uh, for for what they can deliver. But it's like if you went to buy a car and you could only buy an 18-wheeler. 
you know, 18 wheelers are great. There is a place for 18 wheelers. But if you're just turning 16 years old, that's probably not the first thing that you want to buy. You're probably looking for, you know, a, a more economical two-door car. To say nothing of bicycles and roller skates and other things that are that are just as appropriate. Now I think we're starting to see this space equivalent of two-door cars and segways and bicycles and, and roller skates coming onto the market. And that's exciting to me because, you know, we've entered the realm where it is entirely feasible that your local middle school could hold a bake sale and as a result of that fly an experiment into space. Uh, cool. And I, I get really touched by what that's going to do for inspiring those, those, uh, those kids, but also about what the results are going to emerge from that. You know, we just haven't had that many experiments done in a totally novel research environment of outside of the atmosphere uh, and essentially free from the effects of gravity. When we have a lot of experiments there, we're going to see all kinds of things that completely open our eyes. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, so those of you that are maybe just jumped on uh, with us tonight is Will Pomerantz, uh, Vice President for a Special Project with Virgin Galactic. And of course, always with me, Pamela Gay uh, from CosmoQuest X. Always excited to have Pamela. Uh, don't forget, you can ask questions or leave comments either uh, in, in the chatting on YouTube or in uh, the, my, the event page uh, for this um, uh, Hangout on the My Moon Google Plus event page. Um, or you can use uh, Twitter, use the hashtag MyMoonLPI. You can see it there on my uh, my lower third. Um, so, Will, I was, uh, again, on the website, when I was looking, it said uh, it, you did this. There, the Virgin Galactic did a, did tests with people, I believe they said, from like 18 to 88 years old, uh, to see on the, the uh, who, who could physically and mentally be able to do this. And it says like 93% of people actually would be able to pass to do that. So what kind of things do they look at? Uh, sorry, you cut out right at the end of your question. Could you repeat it? Sorry, so, so what, what uh, kind of criteria in terms of your health and, and your mental, physical and mental health did they look at to decide you know, who, who was sure. capable of flying? Yeah, well, well uh, it's certainly in our best interest as a company, and, and both philosophically and in terms of uh, you know, making, a, making good for our investors, that everyone who wants to fly can fly. Uh, this is a pretty different experience than riding, uh, you know, on a Saturn V or a Soyuz or even the space shuttle. You're not going all the way to orbit. You're going suborbital, uh, and the amount of energy that's involved in that equation is is just much less than going orbital. If you think back to your high school physics classes, or maybe some of you watching are in, are in your high school physics classes right now, you know, you sort of think classically about potential energy and kinetic energy. If you want potential energy, that's mgh. That's all we're doing on uh, on a suborbital flight. We're taking it up to altitude, but we're not giving you that velocity, that kinetic energy that's required to go orbital. And really, in that equation, the one half mv squared term, the kinetic energy term, is almost all of the energy involved in going to orbit. So we just don't have to deal with as much energy. We don't have to gain it at the beginning of the flight. We don't have to lose it towards the end of the flight. Uh, and so that allows us to keep the stresses on our astronauts, on our crew, on our vehicle that much lower. Uh, as you said, we had over 90% of our prospective passengers, which was this broad range from teenagers all the way through people in their, in their late 80s, pass uh, our, our full training on the first try. Uh, and we think that essentially everyone will be able to, to pass it with, uh, with a little additional training. Now, we do want people to be quite well prepared for this. Uh, you know, this is kind of the experience of a lifetime. And so when you're up in space, you don't want to be spending any time fiddling around trying to figure out how, to, how do I fasten the seatbelt again and how, how do I move from my seat over to the window I, I, I want to get to. We want all that to be automatic. So we are going to spend a few days with our astronauts preparing them for the flight experience. Uh, but that's not just so that they can handle the physical rigors of it. It's really so that they come down not only safely, but they come down with the biggest possible smile on their face. Right, and it, it said that they it, it talked about maximizing you know your safety of course which is number one, but also the experience. And it, it, one thing I like is that you also train people on you know what they can do and what yeah. they should be prepared to do to get the most out of it. Is that is that so? That's in terms of the physical stuff, but also in terms of are there like specific activities that people can do? You know, taking pictures. What what? Yeah. So so spaceship two is an eight seater vehicle. We have our two pilots in the front, but there's a big cabin in the back for six passengers to be floating around. They will have some room to, to move around to experience weightlessness, which is really a, a novel experiment. 
experience. You can kind of liken it to being on a roller coaster. You can kind of liken it to being in a swimming pool, but it's it's really not the same as those things. It's something that uh, is just tremendously fun, uh, and people are going to want to be doing uh, you know somersaults and and be sort of flying from one end of the cabin to the other. We want to teach them how to do that. We also have a dozen windows kind of in the passenger compartment as well as five up in the front that they'll be able to see through. Uh, so we want to teach our astronauts, hey, if the part of the view that you're looking forward to, let's make sure you can see that. Uh, so some of our future astronauts I know are particularly excited about looking out into the black of space, seeing sort of the limb of the Earth, being able to recognize that our planet is indeed round, that we have sort of this fragile blue layer of our atmosphere. Other people are particularly looking forward to looking down on the ground and recognizing, you know, certain major landmarks. Uh, um, you know, it's particularly if they live in the area or they spent a lot of time there, it's pretty fun to see your house from uh, from 100 kilometers. Uh, so we want to make sure that, that whatever it is they want to do, that, that they're prepared to do that. And, and there's a comp couple of very interesting points about what you're doing. First of all, you're going to this interesting in-between layer of space. You're going higher than Felix did before he did his, his Red Bull world-breaking skydive. And you're doing it in a way that is achievable when you start putting it on the cost perspective of a high school football team so that we can imagine a future where a class of students has, instead of their football boosters, their space boosters. And one member of that class flies into space with a rack of experiments. And that the training they're getting is how do you quickly get through all your experiments during that brief period that you're weightless on suborbit. Absolutely. And I get excited about the idea of you know, I was very fortunate in that I had some great teachers when I was in middle school and in high school. Um, there are a lot of people who, who aren't as fortunate with their choice of teacher, but how much more attention would students pay in their, in their physics class, in their, uh, you know, in their basic science classes, if their teacher had been to space? You know, if, if Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so at the front of the room isn't just blabbing away about something they read in the book a week before you read it, if they're showing a video of an experiment that maybe last year's class designed and, and they themselves operated or a student from last year operated, I think that's going to make much more people at that age when, you know, kids are pretty impressionable and they're making these decisions that perhaps they don't recognize how much it's going to impact their later careers. If it gets them to, to pay a little bit more attention in class, to start to, to dream about those careers, um, you know, that's something that, that really gets me excited. We, we have SEDS UCF asking, how long is a flight? So the whole flight is going to be somewhere on the order of two hours. We actually have this two vehicle system, and, and if I'm up on the main screen here, you can kind of see it pictured behind me. So we have the White Knight 2, which is a, a specialized jet aircraft. I kind of call it a, a catamaran of an aircraft because it has these two fuselages. The two outer fuselages that, that you'll see behind me here um, are, are the, the specialized mothership White Knight 2. You'll start your mission with Spaceship 2 mated to the White Knight 2, just as you see it in this picture here. You'll take off from a, a normal runway uh, at our facility, Spaceport America in southern New Mexico, and you'll spend about an hour with the two vehicles still mated together. That's enough time for the vehicle to take off to climb up to an altitude of about 50,000 feet. That's maybe half again as high as you fly on a traditional commercial airliner if you're, you're taking a flight to visit, visit friends or family or for work. Uh, and then to give the pilots enough time to do all the necessary vehicle checkouts to make sure the weather is what we want it to be, to make sure that the crew and the passengers are comfortable with everything that's about to happen. We'll then release the spaceship. She'll free fall for somewhere like three or four seconds away from the, uh, from the mothership light up a rocket engine. That's going to give you a, a, a nice boost. It's going to kick you up to about three and a half or four times the speed of sound. So you will break the sound barrier. You will be moving pretty quickly. And you'll just take that thing straight up. Uh, you're going to peak out uh, in an altitude that is uh, officially in outer space. You'll earn your wings. You'll have somewhere on the order of uh, three or four minutes to take off your seatbelt, to float around the cabin, to enjoy that lightness, to, to look out those windows. Uh, on the Earth, and as I mentioned earlier, we have more windows than we have passengers, so you don't have to worry about a, a, a greedy fellow passenger hogging the view. You can have whatever view you want. Uh, and then we're coming back home. Uh, Spaceship Two does this really unique reentry system called 
feathering the wings, and, and I'm happy to talk about that later. Uh, but that's just a way that we make sure that you gently and safely come back into the environment, uh, you, you, into the atmosphere, you, you come home safely every time. And then we actually land as an unpowered glider, much like the space shuttle did, uh, on the very same runway that you'd taken off from. So it'll be something like two hours from wheels up to wheel stop. Will, will it always be the exact same runway, or is there, like, my fantasy is, is to be able to get my Virgin Galactic suborbital transcontinental ticket someday in the future? Yeah, we would definitely love to do that. If you hear Sir Richard Branson, our founder, talk, you know, that's absolutely on his radar screen as something we want to do. If I imagine uh, I live in Los Angeles, uh, I fly a lot. If I could get on a flight that left Los Angeles and 45 minutes later was in London, you know, instead of 14 hours later or whatever it is, and oh, by the way, I became an astronaut on the way, um, I think that's a pretty compelling uh, thing. I, w I would sign up for that uh, in a heartbeat. Now, that's a much more demanding job, so you're not going to do that in Spaceship Two. That's something that maybe you do in Spaceship Three or Spaceship Four or, or somewhere down the line, but it's definitely something we'd like to offer. And it means no luggage and no carry-ons, which is an interesting <laughs> side effect. I'm okay with that, though. Really. Excellent. So, Will, have you, have you got to do anything to experience zero-G? Uh, I have, yes. Um, not directly through my job at Virgin Galactic, but actually prior to, uh, to working here, I was uh, something called a coach for the Zero Gravity Corporation. Uh, this is a private company that operates what are called parabolic flights. This is the same method that method that uh, that the U.S., that NASA, and that Russia have used to train all of their astronauts and cosmonauts. Uh, essentially, if you imagine uh, flying an aircraft on sort of a roller coaster type set of hills, uh, when you're on sort of the top half of each of those hills, uh, your plane kind of goes into free fall, and you're falling at the same speed of the plane, which means that you're not experiencing any relative gravity. You do get a chance to, to float around. Uh, in zero G's case, it's in a 727 aircraft with the seats removed and the overhead overhead bins removed, so you have a, a fair amount of space to, to move around. And, and like I said, it's an amazing experience. Um, you have never, even if you think you've experienced something like it, you have never experienced something like it until you've done it. Uh, and it's addicting. When you go once, uh, you know people want to go again. Want to want to really uh, play in it. They want to learn how to how to move around in it. Very cool. And you know, back when you were t you were talking about you know kids being inspired by this, and you know the possibility of them, you know, being able to be the one that goes up, you know, even as a you know as, as a young teenager, that's in some ways that's that's like this next huge leap from what we talk about NASA today, inspiring people to be scientists and engineers and doing these things when they're like in their thirties and forties. It's like wow, now they can do this now. They don't they don't have to wait twenty years and go through school first. So that's 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 pretty exciting too. Definitely, and you know, if you thought the the homecoming king and queen were cool, wait till someone in your class is a is a, an official certified astronaut. That's right. <laughs> uh, we have a question uh, from YouTube from Adam Fury. If a rover was small enough and engineered to handle all the stresses involved when contained within a vibration absorbing sabo, is that right? Uh, would using large-scale electromagnetic rail launch systems be practical? Basically, can you use a rail gun to launch people into space? Oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> um, not something that I have, have personally worked on. Uh, I think rail guns, um, you know, they, they have been used in the past for various, uh, for various applications. Um, I think they can work really well for things that aren't sensitive to acceleration and gravity loads. Uh, and so if you're talking about launching, you know, water uh, up into orbit, which is, you know, something that we, we need a lot of up there for a variety of reasons, you know, maybe that's somewhere where you can talk about using a rail launch system. Putting people on top of it is probably going to be uh, hard. And even, you know, as the question said, designing a rover that can handle those, uh, those G loads is going to be pretty hard. You're going to have to really engineer that thing to handle a, a lot of stress. And uh, you might have gotten to the point where it 
doesn't make more sense than just uh, sticking with more a more conventional launch that that may be more expensive in other ways, but allows you to save so much time and mass uh, on on the rover structure. And and for those of you that don't know what a railgun is, the the idea is you literally have a set of rails that are some feasible length that you can fit at your launch facility, and you use the length of those rails to accelerate a metal object using magnets. It's uh, the same technique that is used in a lot of the Six Flags roller coasters for their Iceman roller coasters that have that magnetic force that launches them out of the turnstiles. Now the problem with things like this is you only have that short distance to accelerate the spacecraft. With conventional rocket systems we are adding force, we are adding velocity for almost the entire launch process. So you are able to accelerate over hundreds of miles instead of hundreds of feet, if, if even that much distance. So to, to go from zero to 15 kilometers per second in a city block is, is a much uh, more bone-breaking phenomena than going from zero to 15 kilometers per second over 200 kilometers. So, at the uh, so it's in New Mexico, uh, is where you have this what they call the Spaceport America, I believe is, is what it's called. So it was the runway for that uh, pretty much as long as the shuttle runway when it would land. You know, it, it's not as long as the uh, as the SLF, if I'm recalling the the, uh, the length for that off the top of my head correctly. Um, you know, we could we could essentially take off from almost any runway in the world. Um, we don't because we want to make sure that we have a runway that's good enough for us to use in a variety of weather conditions and where we have plenty of safety margin. You know, if you're building something from scratch, you may as well build it to be as robust as possible. Uh, but if you if you look at the White Knight again behind me, you know, that's a really big wing. Yeah. And you see it's got four jet engines there, so that's a really overpowered uh, aircraft. If, if you have a chance to see this vehicle take off, particularly when it doesn't have a White Knight 2 on top of it, I mean, this thing looks like it uses only a couple feet of runway and then can take off nearly vertically. It's a, it's a really powerful aircraft. It's a little different when you have a full complement of, uh, of astronauts and fuel in the spaceship. Uh, it needs a little bit more of that runway. But, uh, but we don't need miles and miles and miles of runway. We need some, sort of a more normal length, like you'd see at a lot of commercial and general aviation air, uh, airports around the world. Well, and, and you also have the benefit that your, your feathering technique for coming back down through the atmosphere drops a lot of speed off your system in ways that the space shuttle didn't experience. The space shuttle came in and, and it's inclined landing followed by S-turns. S-turns aren't quite as efficient as basically it pretending to be a badminton birdie. And, and your technique of pretending to be a badminton birdie slows you down so much that you don't need the long runways that the space shuttle's required. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I thought there was a follow-up to that, but I guess not. Uh, we have another question from Nick. Uh, asking, what has been the biggest challenge for Virgin Galactic so far? Uh, it, it's sort of been tying together a lot of little challenges and getting a fully integrated system that, that works, uh, and it works the way we want it to every single time. You know, uh, our, our prototype vehicle system, this is Spaceship Two, uh, as you can guess, it falls onto a vehicle called Spaceship One. And that was up and flying in 2004. That's the vehicle that won this thing called the Ansari X Prize, this international competition for the first privately built vehicle to safely carry human beings into space. Um, so we knew that the core technologies all worked even back then when that, when that vehicle first flew in the summer of 2004, and especially by the time it had completed all of its X Prize winning flights in, in October of 2004. But there's a difference between having a test flight vehicle, a test pilot's vehicle that goes up a couple times, and building something that really will be a robust business that can fly when we want it to, how we want it to, uh, with a full complement of, uh, of astronauts or of research payloads, or ideally you know, being able to accommodate either of the above uh, on a flight. So uh, scaling up that system, you know, we call it Spaceship Two. You know, maybe we should call it some higher number than that because uh, it's not as though we just stuck the blueprints for Spaceship One in a in a photocopier and we hit enlarged two X on it. Uh, it. It's a much more demanding job than that to get the propulsion to work right, to get the thermal protection to work right, to get the aircraft, the mothership to work right. 
Um, no one of those problems is insurmountable, and indeed, even the combined set of all of them isn't insurmountable. But getting all those things to link up exactly right uh, is certainly a challenge. We've, we've had some brilliant people working on it for a while. Um, we're getting awfully close now to, to the, uh, the day that we've all been looking forward to when we enter into commercial service. What, what's kind of neat is is all of the different levels of, of difficulty that you've had from, uh, well, NASA spacesuits are almost entirely uh, custom made for people of specific known body types. Astronauts don't exactly have a variety of shapes and forms. They're military standard in a lot of ways. And you, you're having to come up with ways to have modular plug and play spacesuits. And you're needing to meet all the Americans with Disabilities Act requirements and so many other crazy things that military and governmental based space agencies don't have to fight. And, and when people question why it's taking so long, well, uh, there, there's a difference between getting certified as a military pilot in an F-14 and uh, creating a Boeing 747 that allows grandma to get on in the back in her wheelchair. Yeah, definitely. As you mentioned, we're, we're really broadening the realm of people who have flown. Depending on how you count it, as of today, about 530 people have been to space. And Pamela, like you said, they all are from a medical, from a physiological perspective, pretty much the same, and that the same is excellent condition, you know, very tight age range. Um, for a long time, there were extremely rigorous uh, height brackets. You couldn't be any shorter than X or any taller than Y. Um, we, we don't have that because we want more people to be able to fly, and we, we do have passengers that are substantially older than uh, your typical NASA astronaut, even substantially older than John Glenn was when he became the oldest person in space by a, by a huge margin. Uh, we want all of them to fly, and again, not just come home safely, but come home smiling. Uh, so designing for that is uh, requires some pretty rigorous effort, but uh, but is going along well. Great. Uh, another question uh, from says UCF. Uh, what, what kind of tourists have been looking into flights, and wh where do they come from? Um, they say, for example, Dubai, Japan, India. It's a huge range. Um, we, uh, the U.S., I think we have more customers that come from the U.S. than from any other single countries. Uh, but we do have a, a broad range of, of customers. They, uh, they come in from just about every culture. Um, there are a few that we're, uh, by U.S. law, not allowed to sell to. But essentially, every other region of the world that we're permitted to sell to, we have, we have ready and willing customers there. In fact, one thing that we've done is we've built this network of travel agents. We've given them a fan your name. We call them accredited space agents. Um, but we have these agents on the ground in, in other countries because we know, you know, we may not be fluent in the language and we're certainly not fluent in the culture of a lot of countries where people love space just as much as they do in English-speaking countries. So we want, uh, you know, the space enthusiast from Japan to be able to talk with us and, and figure out what he or she is getting into before they make a purchase. And then we want them to come over here and, and have, have a great time on their flight. Uh, so it. So it is a broad range of people. It's this huge range of ages. Uh, we're not allowed to fly people until they turn 18, but we definitely have customers who are younger than that. And as mentioned previously, we have customers into their, into their late 80s. It's men and women. It's people who come from uh, science and technical backgrounds, but it's also artists and entertainers and you know uh, just family members. It, it, it's, it's a little bit of everything. So uh, there's not the one. Um, generic Virgin Galactic astronaut. It's a, uh, it's a much broader spectrum of that. I also just, since we're talking, I have to give a shout out to SEDS since they've asked a couple questions here. Uh, if you're watching this and you are familiar with SEDS, it's the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. It's the largest student space organization in the world. Uh, I joined SEDS as a freshman in college, uh, and I would not be in this job today. I wouldn't have gotten to do so many cool things if I hadn't done that. So. Uh, if you are a student or you have someone in your family who's a student, I definitely encourage you to check it out. Fantastic. Um, another question uh, from Nick. So, so Will, as we said earlier, is actually formally with the uh, Google Lunar X Prize and the X Prize Foundation in general. And Nick asks, what do you think of the Google Lunar X Prize right now? What, what kind of impacts do you see it having? Sure. Well, first of all, just a little background for anyone who's watching who may not be familiar with it. Uh, the Google Lunar X 
Prize is a $30 million competition for privately funded teams from anywhere on the planet that can successfully build a robot, launch it, have it land on the surface of the moon, and have it move around for uh, about a, a half a kilometer and send back high definition video and images. Uh, the competition was launched, or was started rather, in 2007. Registration is closed now, but I think as of today there are 23 or 24 teams that are competing for this. Um, and, uh, and just this enormous, array, enormous range of, of who they are, of what type of institutions there are. There are nonprofits and for profits and university based teams. There are teams based around you know, tried and true aerospace professionals uh, versus teams that are coming with totally out of the box solutions. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really broad range. Uh, of these things, and you can follow them all online. Uh, I had the pleasure uh, of running that competition for a couple of years, and it's still uh, very much near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I'm really excited to watch what's going on with the teams. You know, we're in this period now where uh, the field, which was way broader than we ever expected it to be, is starting to narrow because you're seeing leaders emerge, and you're also seeing uh, teams start to conglomerate and uh, either acquire each other or merge as they recognize that um, you know, doing that entire job from end to end is extraordinarily difficult. Some teams may be experts in one section, of one phase of that mission and not at all experts in the other. So if they can kind of mix and match, uh, you have these complete efforts. Um, so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's really exciting to see this competition happen. I think there are a lot of great human interest stories coming out of it. But I, like most people, I'm waiting for the big payoff when, when we actually see something land on the lunar surface for the first time since the final Soviet mission in 1976. You know, the Americans haven't sent anything back to the surface, or at least not soft landed anything on the surface since the final Apollo mission in 1972. In 1972, or even 1976, that's a long time ago. You know, Andy and I our, weren't alive. Uh, neither was I. In fact, half of the people who are alive on the planet right now weren't alive back then. Uh, so if, if you imagine in your mind the day when um, these private companies put these rovers uh, on the surface of the moon, you know, Google's the title sponsor uh, of the competition, so you can imagine it would be pretty easy for you to call up video from the surface of the moon on your cell phone. Uh, that's mind-boggling. That's really awesome. It's a, it's a lot of great stories. The teams I know, um, I, I don't have as much insight, obviously, as I used to into what the teams are doing, but I know enough to say that there, uh, you know, there's real work being done here. There's real money being raised. There's real hardware being tested. There are some great ideas. By no means are all 23 teams going to make it to the moon. It's not guaranteed that even one of them will make it, but there's a pretty good shot that some of them will, and, and uh, even that possibility is something really exciting to me. And, and what's amazing is, is the Google Lunar X Prize people have, have really done some amazing work to use this as an opportunity to educate people about space exploration. The Moon Bots Challenge has kids designing robots to explore their own admittedly tabletop version of the moon. And just like we're seeing with the real teams that are competing, you have the walkers, you have the rovers, you have all the different ways of getting those 500 meters. Well, the people working in their classrooms also have that same diversity and creativity. And so we're looking at a future where people are right now pretending to build things in high school that they may be building for real 10 years from now. And it's not a science fiction future they're imagining. It's they are parallel acting on the same problems that are being worked on in real laboratories. And this is future employment for them. Yeah, definitely. And it's also such an international competition. One thing I really like is that we're seeing teams emerge in countries that don't have their own space programs. You know, right now, I think 20 or so of the teams are at a team summit that I think just started a few hours ago that's in Chile. Chile does not have a national space agency, um, certainly not one of, of, the, uh, of the level of prestige uh, of a NASA or of a Russian space agency or Chinese space agency, but there's a team there. There are teams in Hungary. There are teams in all these other uh, countries where, again, maybe if, if, you are, uh, if you are an interested citizen, whether you're a student or a parent or a community leader, uh, you didn't have that ability necessarily to take your kids on a field trip to the local space center because there wasn't one. And now there is one. Now there are people that speak your language that you can relate to. 
uh, that are working on something substantive and that probably want your help. Uh, so that, that just ties so many more people into this. Yeah, we've, we've had, um, I believe, three different uh, Lunar X Prize teams do my movie webcasts, and they've all been just unique in, yeah. in, a, in what it is that they're, that they're wanting to send up there. So that's, that's been really great. And in fact, uh, our next webcast in a couple of weeks is somebody with Lunar X Prize, Leo Camacho. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be speaking with him more about Lunar X Prize. Um, we do, in the meantime, we have a question from Ulysses. Uh, he says he might have missed this, but I don't, I don't think you did. Uh, he says, but if Elon Musk offers competitive rates and takes people to orbit, how do you compete? Well, we're, we're big fans of Elon's and big fans of SpaceX. Uh, what they've done has been an inspiration to us, as it has to, I think, everyone in the industry. Uh, they have uh, put their money where their mouth is and, and just de demonstrated incredible results. So uh, I have every confidence that they are going to be doing that. Uh, but even with the great breakthroughs that they've made in, in, uh, in price for their payloads, they're still offering a very different service than they are. And even at their lowest imaginable price, they're going to be a lot more expensive than, than, than we are. Uh, you know, the, if you wanted to go out, you could go out right now and you could buy a ride to space to go to orbit. You'd be buying it through an American company called Space Adventures, but riding on a, on a Russian rocket, the Soyuz, the same one that, uh, that the astronauts and cosmonauts who, who launched just uh, a day or two ago took to go to the International Space Station. But that's going to cost you on the order of 50 or 60 million dollars. You know, that's a, that's a lot of money. Uh, I, I think there are, is the potential with companies like SpaceX and others that that number is going to come down, but it's still going to be in that tens of millions of dollars range. And there's a big difference between the number of people who can afford that and the number of people who can afford a, a $200,000 ticket for granted a very different experience. And, uh, and so I really see the two as complementary. I, I think there are going to be some of our customers who, who fly suborbital, who get really excited about it, and they want to go up to that next level, and, and so they ultimately become customers of an orbital experience. Similarly, there will be people who want to go to that orbital experience uh, who want to you know, try before they buy uh, at something at a, at a little more reasonable price point. So uh, I don't know that it will necessarily be uh, competition. I think it will, in fact, be uh, mutually supportive. And you made a really good point about why this is earlier. You're not going as as high as as the orbital folks go, so you don't need to invest as much energy into the trip. So while they may drive costs down for getting to orbital, your costs for getting to suborbital are going to come down at the same time as the technologies improve and things get more energy efficient. But just as it's always going to be cheaper to go from Boston to New York than it is to go from Boston to London, it's always going to be cheaper to go from the ground to suborbital versus from the ground all the way up into outer space at the orbital staying in orbit level. Right, and uh, maybe you don't want to say anything about this, but does uh, Virgin Galactic have any just thoughts Thoughts of maybe really in the future going beyond suborbital? You know, it's definitely something in the long run we would love to do. Uh, if you've ever heard Sir Richard uh, speak, you know that he's an ambitious guy and he's, uh, he's open to all kinds of ideas. Um, he's always thinking, you know, 10 chess moves ahead. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. If you ask him, he would love for us to be doing suborbital today and point to point tomorrow and orbital the day after that, and then hotels on the moon the day after that. Um, you know, we're not necessarily actively working on many of those things, uh, although in the specific realm of orbital, in a way we are, because now we have this Launcher One program. Now that's not humans. Um, it's only for, for smaller satellites, but it's going to teach us some of the lessons and help us to develop some of the technologies that might eventually feed into a human orbital program down the road. Great. Uh, another question from Nick. When, when do you think we might start seeing space hotels? It's a great question, and you know it, it could be soon. Um, those of you who who uh, who aren't already familiar with a company called Bigelow Aerospace, uh, you know, go to Google as soon as this hangout is over and and, and look it up. Um, they are doing some really amazing things with uh, with space stations that are actually inflatable, which allows you to launch them on a smaller rocket and and develop this sort of big free space um, in outer space that, that you can float around in. They just uh, a month or two ago announced a deal with NASA where they are going to carry one of these things up and, and mount it to the International Space Station. They've already flown a few prototype units, but, but this will be the first time that we've had human astronauts 
going into one of these inflatable hotels. Uh, that flight isn't happening, I think, for a, for, for a couple of years now, but it's not that far off. And I'm pretty confident that once they've demonstrated that you can do it, um, there are people who will do it. They still have to solve the problem of it doesn't do you much good to, uh, to have a hotel if no one can get to your hotel. So we need the whole industry to develop to the point where, uh, where you can get the trip to the hotel as well as having the hotel itself. Uh, but all this stuff is real. It's not science fiction anymore. It's things that you know, real professional men and women are working on and real uh, men and women are, are purchasing tickets for. Great. Oh, sorry, I, I was muted. Uh, great. Well, we'll uh, I think we're going to wrap up here. So I want to just warn you uh, here in a few minutes, we're going to kind of ask you for some final words that you might have. Uh, so while you're thinking about that, does anybody out there have any uh, final questions you want to ask Will about the Virgin Galactic or maybe even the Lunar X Prize? Because uh, he has been involved with both, of course. And so we're seeing Jose Molina is asking or, or stating, as a student in space, in space enthusiast, what can I do to get students interested in formulating experiments to be flown with Virgin Galactic? That's a great question, and actually it leads right into the, the final remarks that I was going to make. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I've been a space geek for a long time. I, I love my job. I love the industry I work in. And I think that this is a particularly fascinating time to be involved in space exploration. Because something is true now that has really never been true in the past. And that is that every one of you who's watching this Hangout or watching it later on YouTube, regardless of how old you are, what country you're from, what grades you got in school, you can get involved in space right now. Uh, and not just as a passive consumer who's watching this on the television. You can start doing real substantive things right now. Uh, and I think that, you know, for me that made all the difference uh, between a field that I sort of passively watch and something I can get my hands dirty and, and actually be involved in. There are great programs, whether it is something like Moonbots where you are doing hands-on educational work with Lego sets, uh, but you are also now starting to see schools build these things called CubeSats, which are actual satellites that are you know, not that much bigger than, than your fist. They're 10 centimeters to an edge. You can build those without a whole lot of expertise and without a whole lot of money and actually send something into space. There are also purely online things. I, I know that probably a lot of the people watching this are already familiar with... Uh, with Moon Zoo, with, with Galaxy Zoo, with these, with these systems where you can use CosmoQuest, the one co-hosting this show. Exactly, where you can go online and you can actually be helping scientists classify real data from real telescopes, helping us learn about our universe. I mean, how, how cool is that? And again, uh, I don't think they ask you what your GPA is when you, log, when you log on to any of those websites. You don't need a degree from MIT. You just need the willingness to do it. Uh, so there are, um, there are tons of those activities now. There are also lots of great lesson plans, you know, NASA and other organizations. If you just do a search for space lesson plans, you could probably find something that's appropriate to your educational level, to your uh, interest level. Um, but I prefer, you know, I think the best way to learn is to learn by doing. Um, so if you are excited about this, if you want humanity to become a space-bearing species, if you want to personally go or make it so that your loved ones should go, don't just be a, uh, don't just be a passive participant. Go out there and, and, uh, and contribute. You can start this, this evening. So, so that, that all sounds great. And um, I, I'm going to just sum up what, what poor Andy was trying to read in the, the chat window as I torture him with little tiny type. I, what, what you brought up with citizen science is such a powerful thing. With, with CosmoQuest, we've actually shown uh, with both data related to the moon and with Vesta that the public's results are just as good as the professional's results. And we're working on drafting up the papers to publish that. You can see the graphics that show this on our on our blog and so you can go out and you can be a meaningful part of allowing NASA to do research it couldn't do any other way because we simply don't have the human resources to do what well what thousands of people logging into their computers can do from home and and so together you can map out the places with CosmoQuest that 
the spacecraft that are being developed for the Lunar X Prize can go and visit in our future. And so we are all part of an ecosystem of space exploration. And, and Will is, is helping us figure out with his organization how to get that first rung up the ladder into suborbital spaceflight. Yes, and I will warn you, if you go to CosmoQuest, you just might get trapped in there for a whole day. It's really easy to just hang out on that site for a day. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's fun that you probably would never realize you would have if you've never done it before. So, anyway, uh, well, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Will, very much uh, for joining us this evening. And thank you, Pamela, for your assistance, as always. And this, of course, has been a joint production between my moon and CosmoQuest. Um, you can go mark up the moon at CosmoQuest.org. There's other ways you can also mark up Mercury and images of the asteroid Vesta. Lots of stuff to do on there. Uh, my moon at MyMoonSpace.com. You can check out some more. Just, let's just call it goofy things related to lunar science uh, on the website. And I'll just let you go go check it out. Somebody once called My Moon schizophrenic. It's brilliant. <laughs> it, it's my favorite web design, and I do web design. <laughs> So go check us both out. Uh, go check out the Virgin Galactic site as well. A lot of good stuff on there. Uh, the next Hangout uh, with CosmoQuest, anyway, uh, by ourselves, is tomorrow at 4 p.m. It's a learning space, 4 p.m. Pacific with CosmoQuest, discussing Yuri's Night, which is this international celebration uh, honoring the guy that started it all, uh, Yuri Gagarin. Um, and our next My Moon our My Moon Cosmo Quest joint hangout is in two weeks on the uh, 16th, again with Leo Camacho from the uh, Google Lunar X Prize. So be looking for more information on connecting to that. And again, thank you everybody for joining us, and we hope to see you again in a few weeks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.